Hello everyone, and great to see so many of you tuning in for such an interesting and important topic. My name is Kate Tarrant, and I work for the Lower Blackwood Landcare Group based in the southwest of Western Australia. For those of you that don't know us, we are a not-for-profit independent landcare organisation with an interest in sustainable agriculture and the broader environment and river health in the Lower Blackwood catchment. You can find out more about us and the work we do on our website, lowerblackwood.com.au. This webinar today is funded, is delivered in partnership with the Southwest Growers Group and is supported through funding from the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund, the Augusta Margaret River Shire Environmental Management Fund, and SoilWise. SoilWise is funded by the National Land Care Programme Smart um, Farm Small Grants and an Australian Government initiative. It is supported by Healthy Estuaries WA, a state government programme. Um, before we kick off fully, I'd like to acknowledge that our Lower Blackwood catchment and the work we do falls within Wadandi and Pibbulmin Budja, within which our streams and tributaries flow to join the Great Pilbula, the Blackwood River. We recognise and respect that Wadandi and Pibbulmin ancestors and their descendants are the traditional custodians of this country and they have a long and continuing connection to this land. Um, for our audience, just a few words about how the webinar is going to run today. You may have noticed by now that you can hear us but not speak yourselves. That's deliberate so we can keep things moving along at a good pace. You can definitely still ask questions though. So please don't be shy, just type your questions anytime into the chat box and I'll make sure it gets asked at the end of the presentation. Also, if you run into any technical difficulties, please, please use the status button at the bottom of the screen, bottom right hand of the screen, to let me know and I'll see if I can fix it at our end. Don't worry though, if you do have to leave early or it drops out, uh, we'll be recording the session, which I'll email out, out to you all next week. Okay, enough of all that housekeeping. Uh, let's get to the real reason you've tuned in. I'm delighted to, to have talking to us today, agronomist Jade Killeran. Jade is an independent multi-species cover crop advisor and researcher working in Victorian grazing systems. Jade founded Healthy Farming Systems in 2020 and likes nothing better than to be out on farm helping farmers trial, adopt and manage multi-species cover crops. Jade has a strong background in paddock scale research and is extremely passionate about multi-species pastures and cover crops and their potential benefits for livestock-based farming systems. We invited Jade today to share her knowledge and experience with us. Although the Victorian climate is slightly different to to ours here in the lower southwest of Western Australia. It is similar enough, enough that so much of what she has to say um, is around getting multi-species pastures is very applicable for to our environment. So a big welcome to you, Jade, and I'm gonna hand over you to take over. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so thank you all also for tuning in. Um, it's really nice to see so much interest in region egg. Um, so we'll just get started. So. Uh, the slides I'm going to share with you today will mostly be centred around uh, some work I've done in the last four years in paddock scale trials across Victoria and some of the findings that I think might be pertinent for you as well. So uh, I based my honours here around uh, multi-species cover cropping because I just think they're amazing. Um, I was fascinated to learn uh, post my traditional uni degree that improving plant diversity can improve fodder from a livestock based grazing system perspective, but also activate soil biology as well. And that that activation of soil biology is so crucial and is such a big driver for the farming system. So I just thought what a fantastic opportunity that multi-species might have for us in Australia and in Victoria. Uh, and the questions I'm, I asked and am still asking, are: uh, can we graze and make money off these multi-species while in, in essence, fixing our soils, our poor, degraded Australian soils and our farming systems. So what I'm trying to answer with the paddock scale trials are, will multi-species work on real life farms? What are the economic um, effects of adopting multi-species? So do they stack up in against conventional farming systems in a grazing sense? And what are the changes we can have? And that's a dual focus for production uh, and also soil health and environmental changes as well. And what does that time frame look like? Do we Does it work in one year? Do we see immediate results? Do we have to wait 10 years? So I really want to establish a bit of a pathway for multi-species adoptions on farm if this early data is proving to be um, positive, which uh, it is and we'll share in a moment.
So before we get too far into it, just back to the basics, when I'm thinking about a multi-species fodder, the diversity is crucially important. Uh, and the dual focus on fodder from a livestock grazing sense, but also that protection and improvement of soil is really, really important um, for the multi-species. So that's really what sets it apart from a conventional uh, pasture mix is the diversity within the mix and the fact that we are intentionally trying to protect and improve soil. So when I'm making up a mix, I like to keep it reasonably simple. Um, five to 12 species, I think is quite enough, uh, especially when you're getting started. And as long as you're ticking these four main plant family goals, so grasses, and that can be actual grasses, as in perennial ryegrass, Phalaris coxfoot, et cetera, but it can also be uh, winter cereals like oats, wheat, barley, ryecorn, et cetera, and um, our summer grasses, so corn, millet, sorghum those types of things. As long as we're ticking the grass box, legume, broadleaf and brassica, we can put together a mix uh, in autumn or in spring and in summer, depending, um, particularly in WA. Uh, we can put together a mix that is quite functionally diverse for our soil biology and our livestock, but is also not too complicated as well. So as long as we're ticking those four plant family boxes and we might include two of each, um, that gives us quite enough functional diversity without becoming too complicated or expensive. When I'm looking at a mix, I like to start off with annuals. Annuals are more aggressive and they, uh, they establish more effectively in, um, in tough conditions. So I do try and stick to an annual or mostly annual mix at the start. But the end goal is to get to a perennial mix. So to have a self-replicating diverse perennial pasture is the eventual goal. Uh, what I like about the multi-species is because we can tweak the species within them, uh, we can plant in autumn, spring or summer, depending on soil moisture. So we have quite a lot of flexibility in the system in order to fit them into a farming uh, enterprise. So some of the benefits um, that I've seen over the last couple of years, um, this is just doing uh, mostly split paddock trials, conventional versus multi-species. Um, we have quite a lot of high quality feed because of the legumes and the broadleaves and brassicas within the mix. They give us a lot of quality feed for our livestock uh, and they can be very, very aggressively growing. So we get high tonnages as well, which um, in, an, in our environment, in the Victorian environment, in an autumn winter um, growing period is not surprising, but is quite surprising outside of that um, rainfall period. So into the summer and early autumn, we see quite good results from that high tonnage yield. Um, the pictures behind the text give you some idea of what we're talking about there. Using that out of season rainfall um, can be very beneficial in terms of economics. Um, the lovely Frisian or mostly Frisian heifers there on the left-hand side are enjoying a summer multi-species and that's the same or a similar mix in the autumn once all the summer multi-species are grazed out or the summer active species are grazed out. So we can certainly use that out of season rainfall to produce feed wedges, um, potentially uh, less so in WA, but certainly here in Victoria, um, in, in all rainfall zones, it's proving to be very effective. We can reduce a lot of inputs. Um, hay and silage immediately start to be reduced in terms of um, having to conserve that fodder on the farm, but also potentially having to buy it in. Uh, and we see some uh, lower inputs in terms of fertiliser and chemical as well. Uh, also, the risk, uh, if we can uh, get a summer multi-species up and going, um, we have a lot less fire and drought risk, of course, because of that green feed on the farm. So there's quite a lot of economic um, benefits from introducing the multi-species, but the big driver is the soil health benefits. So diversity is the, is the major um, benefit from the multi-species in terms of soil health. That really drives the rest of the system. So that diversity and response to rainfall across the season protects the soil uh, for longer periods of the year than we're otherwise used to. And we also support our soil biology and increase our soil organic carbon for longer periods of the year when, than we're used to as well. So that's very, very important. Uh, hopefully most of you will have seen the picture on the left-hand side. Um, this is uh, the wonderful Christine Jones and her liquid carbon pathway. Uh, and I will just boil that down very quickly in a couple of minutes. Um, we could all listen to Christine Jones for hours, but I will condense it quite quickly. So 
The diversity of the multi-species um, helps us really support our biological activity and our diversity. And that's crucially important for our farming systems because the plant feeds the biology and the biology feeds plants. It's a positive um, symbiotic relationship. And what we need it to do from a natural system is to be allowing the plant to access more nutrients and more moisture than it otherwise would by itself. And that's where our soil biology come in. Uh, and when our plant is photosynthesizing effectively, it instigates that um, relationship and is able to fossic more nutrients and moisture out of the soil in return for putting those exudates back into the soil and for the microbiology. What the biology do as well when they're activated and there's large thriving populations from a diverse pasture mix is that they aggregate the soil quite effectively. So they release substances called glomalin, um, which is sort of a soil glue, and they, they aggregate the soil. So they make the soil well structured so that we can also store more carbon and moisture and nutrients in the soil. So the end result is that we have hopefully a really nice, well aggregated soil with a really active, diverse soil biological population that is improving plant health and productivity and in, in turn improving animal health and human health and productivity and um, also having a beneficial effect on ecosystem function as well. So we end up having a really fertile, diverse, healthy, resilient farm just from focusing on activating and supporting our soil biology. So the, that plant soil biology relationship is really the driver for a healthy, resilient system. So what's happening in Victoria? I've put you up all a little map, um, just in case some of the place names I say are a little bit um, unfamiliar. So I work mainly um, from where it says Victoria, pretty much south in a line. So I work, I cover um, medium to high rainfall zones, um, some cropping, but, but the majority livestock. But I do head up occasionally uh, into Northern Victoria into some um, probably low rain, we will classify them as low rainfall zones with lower summer rainfall. So I will share um, a reasonable amount of the, uh, the, the insights, I suppose, from those regions as well as down south. So hopefully we'll be able to um, impart some information to you. So some of the project learnings, um, there's about 14 land care groups across Victoria uh, trialling multi-species or that have multi-species projects ongoing and, and that's the ones I know of. Um, there's probably a few that I don't know of or, or many that I don't know of. Um, but from the last four to five years and and uh, nine land care groups that I've oh, that I've been involved with, that establishment is really effective. It must be really effective. So um, I've highlighted it and put it in red and put it in capital. So when we're trying to establish our multi-species, we must be effective um, with our establishment. Otherwise, we can't do any good with our multi-species if we can't get it up and going. So we need to be quite realistic um, about establishing that multi-species. We need to use tools in the toolbox, especially in those transition phases, uh, so that we can get the multi-species up and going and have a positive impact on the farm. Uh, there are some mindset challenges or some mindset changes that need to be embraced um, when we're talking about uh, multi-species on farm, particularly in a grazing sense. Um, there are some management changes around grazing practices, which I know um, you've had Dick Richardson uh, talk to you, so that would have been a fantastic introduction and um, lots of practical knowledge there. So that will help a lot in terms of embracing that mindset, but certainly grazing management and just managing the multi-species, there are uh, a few changes to embrace. And we have to be a little bit realistic about what the multi-species can do in the farming system. So uh, it's not a silver bullet. They are a collection of plants and we need to be realistic about the situation that we've put them into. So um, we need to be uh, mindful that, um, that they can only do so much in a farming system, especially at first. Uh, in the transition phase, if we're starting off from a conventional farming system and changing across to a more regen multi-species system, that transition has to be fairly slow and, and subtle. So we need to transition across over a couple of years so that we don't have any um, economic uh, um, deficits, I suppose, with adopting the regen. Uh, again, annual mixes first, um, then earning the right to move to perennials, which we will talk 
about a little bit later. Um, but if we get that right, the multi-species can be really productive and profitable, and we'll go through that now in terms of um, some um, side-by-side -side comparisons. But also just starting off, sorry, my slide's loading. I don't know if it's loading for you. Um, starting off with some of the learnings, just a couple of slides about um, establishment practices. So although I don't love chemical or cultivation, um, in those transition years, we've found it to be quite effective. So uh, direct drilling into pastures we found to be very difficult, especially if the pastures are active in some way. And, and uh, in our autumn and our spring periods in Victoria, they're quite active. And we do find it very difficult to oversow a multi-species into those without any, uh, any control of them. So this is just showcasing that. This is up uh, northwest of Ballarat. Uh, the, the control area I'm in is a past, a, a pasture direct drilled with a multi-species. And the line over there that you can see uh, is where we started to spray Roundup. So while we don't necessarily want to spray Roundup, um, you can see that there's a very distinct line between where we did and didn't spray Roundup. So these types of tools, especially in those transition years, can help us get the multi-species going. Uh, this is Gippsland, so just a different environment. So um, this was a big trend across the last four years um, in trials, but also uh, on a lot of farmers' paddocks where they wanted to direct drill. Um, and I was having to tell them that it probably wasn't going to be overly successful. So this is just another example. This is a, um, a dairy farm and they're running a conventional versus region split paddock trial. Uh, they've got an Italian ryegrass uh, on the left-hand side. You can see this was sprayed out and fertilised at sowing with 50 kilos of MAP down the tube. Uh, right next door to it is the, um, the split in the paddock, and this was a um, autumn multi-species direct drilled into a summer multi-species. Um, you can see some chicory there left over from the summer. So it was very productive over the summer, um, but the chicory stuck around, of course, being a perennial and our autumn grasses um, started to shoot off pretty much at the same time we sowed the multi-species and the autumn multi-species uh, had a very hard time establishing. So the picture on the right-hand side is the same mix that we sowed in the middle. The only difference is that we sprayed out the paddock first before we sowed this one because it wasn't part of the trial. So we wanted to see what direct drilling would do in this environment because it is a, a, a tenant of region ag if, if you um, follow the rules really, really rigidly, um, direct drilling straight into that active pasture with no chemical, but you can see the difference in biomass there. So it's just really important to be um, to be practical. This was a trial, so we, we captured that information, um, but it's not something I would advise doing, and, and that's the reason why. So you can see the massive biomass difference there between the two. Um, just covering all bases, this is Southwest Vic. This is a uh, machinery demo uh, split plot. The little pigtail in the middle there um, divides the two plots. And this is sowing uh, in spring into an active pasture. And we had the soil key on one side and a disc drill on the other. And you can only see just very occasionally a little bit of crop or multi-species on the, on the two sides. The, the majority of it failed. So that establishment, just over sowing into those active pastures is very difficult um, across Victoria. So it's just something to be mindful of if you're establishing multi-species. So across Victoria, when we were more aggressive in our establishment practices, we achieved really good soil health and fodder benefits. And by aggressive, I mean with um, chemical or cultivation or fertiliser. So we'll just run you through a few of those results. So this is uh, in northwest Victoria. Um, this was a multi-species trial, but we overlaid it with um, a, a trial of fertiliser as well. So these are our treatments, no fertiliser at all, but a autumn multi-species mix uh, MAP spread after sowing at 70 kilos to the hectare and then MAP plus biologicals which was five litres of seaweed secrets, two litres of compost extract and a litre of a liquid calcium as a foliar applied um, or probably about eight weeks after sowing I would say uh, once the crop had got up a little bit and these are the, um, the biomass results left to right so our no vert 
uh, multi-species did struggle a bit, especially this was a little bit of a hungry paddock as well. So obviously it's much more noticeable in a hungry paddock. Uh, and, and we're heading into sort of 800 kilo territory range. Our MAP in the middle is 1.9 tonnes uh, at the same time, so same day. And our MAP in biologicals is 2.9 tonnes. So um, not only are we having a much greater increase in potter production above ground, we're also driving those roots down into the system, making sure that they're effective in photosynthesizing and getting our organic carbon and our exudates down into the soil as well. So there's a lot of um, soil biology support that we're doing by encouraging our plants to grow more as well. So um, 70 kilos of map uh, over here is, is only considered sort of starter fertilizer. Um, it's not a particularly heavy synthetic fert rate, um, but just shows you what a little bit of TLC in terms of fert can do to maximise your multi-species. Uh, this is um, a, a similar sort of trial, again, um, northwest of Ballarat. This was a hay paddock that had been taken over by um, a, a region farmer host um, very recently. And unfortunately, um, because of hay cut there forever, um, the control pasture was pretty much onion grass and capeweed. Uh, and when I came to cut it in August, I couldn't really cut the onion grass with my secateurs. It was impervious to my to my shears um, and the capeweed wasn't doing a lot either. So I actually skipped cutting that because it was uh, mostly impossible. Right next door to it was the offset disc rest of the paddock, which was sewn down to a multi-species. And then we had a strip where we coated the seed with a, a worm tea extract and also um, applied it at a folio rate twice. Our bare multi species was growing us nearly a ton and our worm tea, just a little bit of worm tea um, was growing us 1.6 ton. This is an organic farm, so um, they obviously weren't prepared to use any synthetic ferts, but certainly just uh, the addition of seed gave them a much better result, but then addition of a little bit of biological fert again, gave them a better result than that. So again, I should reiterate a slightly hungry paddock um, obviously, the control does give you that impression, so um, that bit of fur really kicks it on. So these are the, the paddocks that we just looked at. These are the soils. So this was the first paddock, and this was the paddock, the hay paddock that we just looked at. So quite a nice soil, actually, underneath that. But you can see those lovely um, dreadlocked roots that are starting to happen, a really good sign of biological activity. So we're starting to improve our soils by driving that, that fodder production with our multi-species. So certainly having a beneficial impact on aggregation and biological activity as well. So these are some trials further south, and this is the, the machinery side of being a bit more aggressive. So um, this, will be, uh, I suppose, an, an expose of some light soil type results, but we also have some, some medium to heavy soil types in the southwest. Um, we are a dairy zone down here, mostly, with um, some beef a little bit further north, but mainly dairy um, in a high rainfall zone, 700 to 1200 millimetres of rainfall. So these trials went out on 23 farms, um, 17, of these regen trials wanted to trial multi-species, which was really great. And we shandied in some different machines that we wanted to look at. So we used a disc drill and a power harrow as our um, traditional modes of sowing through the district. Um, and we tried the soil key on the left-hand side and the rotor strip tool on the right-hand side, both um, novel methods of establishing pastures and multi-species for our region. Um, they certainly affected the establishment. We have seen that slightly already, but we'll go into it in a bit more depth. Um, there was a heap of biomass improvements. We had, did this trial, uh, two sets of trials, um, but they were both a year long. Um, but we had great amounts of biomass improvements, but no real negative or positive changes for soil health. So um, slightly reassuring because we did do some cultivation and on our medium and heavy soils, that actually didn't set us back. Um, but no real changes in that short time frame for any positive changes in soil health either. So this is a paddock where we tried the four machines side by side, and we did want to be able to test out whether we could 
sow um, the multi-species into an active pasture because we have um, usually perennial ryegrass pastures on, on the, um, the dairy farms down here. And often the, the wish is to improve the diversity of the paddock, but not necessarily knock the whole paddock out because it is usually a productive perennial ryegrass floating around underneath there. So what we wanted to do was see which of these machines could be effective. Uh, and this is a medium to heavy soil type, and these are our results. So we have the um, Vardastat disc drill on the left-hand side, um, which has given us a millet plant in the middle and a tillage radish plant down in the left-hand corner, but that's about it. Um, so no real establishment from the multi-species, unfortunately. We have the soil key next, which gave us rows like this, but stayed about that size for the whole summer, and it was quite a kind summer, so it should have um, grown. But I, I believe the, the establishment wasn't aggressive enough. Um, the level of cultivation that we had with the soil key wasn't aggressive enough for this particular soil type. So for our medium heavy soils, we don't consider the soil key, especially in the first year, aggressive enough to get our mixes up and going. Uh, this is all without chemical termination, of course. So we're trying to just to avoid chemical in this instance, in this trial, um, and just use our, our cultivation. Uh, in the uh, sort of middle is the row to strip till, so a much wider um, sowing row than the soil key and a much better establishment result. So the, the species have room to grow and to get up and move, and they certainly have done that in those strips, so quite a good result. And then we have the power harrow, which is quite an aggressive form of cultivation, but nevertheless gave us quite a good result um, in, into that active pasture. So where the soil key was successful, which I think is probably applicable in, in WA on your lighter soils, is that uh, we did try it on 13 of uh, on 13 paddocks uh, in the trial. It was it was the machine we most wanted to test because it has got a, a, a good amount of positive press in the last couple of years and it and it is seen as a machine that can successfully sow multi-species. So we wanted to test it in our region. Um, and unfortunately we have a large percentage of heavy soil types or medium to heavy soil types in the region, but we do have some lighter soils. So where the soil key was really successful was on these lighter soils. Um, so this, as an example, is one of the two successful paddocks, and it was an annual ryegrass pasture that had already been cut for silage. So that annual ryegrass has pretty much done its race. You can see it's all seed heady. I'm standing in it looking towards the multi-species mix. Um, so it's not particularly competitive and the soil type is quite light, light and able to work up tilth really quite easily. So in those instances, um, bowling straight in with the soil key and being able to sow a multi-species was quite successful. So uh, in the spring of, this was 2020, when we were doing these trials, um, the control pasture in February was growing us about a tonne of, of mostly um, seed head ryegrass, and our soil key was giving us nearly three tonnes of feed. So certainly, um, in our environment with uh, summer rainfall, we can grow a considerable amount of feed um, off these multi-species mixes, these summer active mixes. We also tried some compost on this paddock at three tonnes the hectare, and it gave us uh, just a couple of hundred kilos more than the multi-species mix. Um, this is the rotor strip tool, which again is similar premise to the soil key in that it stitches multi-species into pasture that you may want to keep, um, but I think it is probably a little bit of, more applicable for our region. Um, this is on a lighter soil type though, uh, down towards the coast, and it obviously was very highly su successful. But what we found, as well as um, a marked increase in biomass, was that the next spring when we came to do our ending soil tests and our visual soil assessments, even though this is a light soil type, the improvement in um, in worm count and aeration in those strips in comparison to the, con the control pasture between the strips and in the remainder of the paddock was actually quite significant. So there was actually a, a soil health improvement in those strips, even though we considered it to be a lighter, uh, more sandy soil type, which we thought was quite interesting. Um, finally, this is flipping the um, summer dry matter uh, on its head a little bit and um, focusing on driving the autumn feed wedge. 
So this is, is a farm that's very, very wet and has quite heavy soils. So the spring and summer period of time is not particularly difficult in order for them to feed their cows, but it is difficult for them with winter ward logging to maintain that feed wedge in the autumn and winter. They have part of the farm that actually goes fully underwater, so they are quite tight for feed um, on an ordinary year. They're also an organic dairy farm, so they can't push that production with synthetic ferts either. So um, the advice for them was to undertake some drainage on some of their wetter paddocks, which was done. You can see the drain running uh, down the middle. And there's also strategic drains heading through um, this crop as well, uh, as you can see in this other photo. So drains um, going to the fall, but also um, heading through the crop at certain times as well. So what we really wanted to do was get that drainage in place and then grow a really aggressive annual multi-species mix, which would give them a huge amount of bulk on these wetter paddocks and that they could then feed these off with the dairy herd and then move on to other drier parts of the farm in, in sort of mid-winter when these paddocks were getting a little bit too wet. So starting off with the feed wedge on these wetter paddocks in full recognition that they wouldn't be back here until spring uh, and then moving on to other parts of the farm later, which had um, responded to the autumn break and created their own feed wedge while we were grazing off this feed wedge. And it worked quite well. So uh, when I went to do some cuts, this was a March sowing. They, um, there was an awful scatter to get the seed in because there was a rainfall event coming and they were lucky enough to get that rainfall event. It was a bit over an inch and it really got them going. Uh, and from uh, a March sowing in June, the base perennial pasture um, that they would otherwise have used, which is what you can see on this bank here, was growing them just under two ton and the multi-species was growing them just over six tons. So we tripled their feed wedge on these paddocks and it just, it was about 10% of their farm. We, we went in reasonably aggressively with the multi-species on these wetter areas of the farm and it just revolutionised their feed wedge. So on, uh, in terms of being able to maximise that feed wedge and grow bulk feed um, and have bulk residue to feed our soil biology, though that really aggressive annual multi-species can be very effective. So some of those results, um, effective establishment is really crucial and whether that's chemical or cultivation, um, that's, that's up to your cringe test, which one you would prefer to use and which one is more applicable for your soil type as well. There are a lot of production benefits that we can have from livestock systems and certainly there are reductions in feed gaps. What I'm starting to see is a trend in some increases in soil carbon. They're slow because increases in soil carbon are slow and are also a little bit difficult to measure. But I do have very interesting results in terms of rooting depth and water use efficiency in terms of that uh, deeper, um, especially tap roots getting down into that subsoil moisture and starting to cycle it and use it more effectively. Um, so we do see um, some soil health benefits starting to come along as well in a relatively short time frame of one to two years after these trials. Uh, we also at Hatesbury Landcare, um, myself and a colleague who, who were supporting HB Landcare as advisors. After the results of those trials, especially on those medium to heavy soils, we wanted to, um, to provide a, a calculator, uh, it ended up being called, for the level of cultivation that a grower may need um, before he puts in a multi-species or a pasture. So what we wanted to do was take a little bit of the guesswork um, out of that sowing and out of that establishment phase if um, the aim was to use cultivation rather than chemical. So we decided that there were four factors that were very important for um, getting the multi-species up and going. And we put some figures around them after much tweaking. And um, this is what you see here. So this cultivation calculator, if you are thinking of cultivation rather than chemical to get your multi-species up and going and prepare the paddock for the multi-species, this is freely available on the Hatesbury, Lancare, uh, Hatesbury District Landcare Network website. And it might be just a way to give you a bit of a guide as to um, what cultivation level you, you may be needing to um, use to get the multi-species up. So for us in the southwest, we have a lot of medium to heavy soil types. So the finding is that we need to be more aggressive uh, in our establishment phase with um, more aggressive cultivation to get those up. Uh, if you have a lighter soil type, which WA does do, um, you will be able to use that cultivation calculator by plugging in the fact that you have a light soil 
and various other parameters to give you a bit of a guide as well. So um, it's not intended as a, a crystal ball or a, a particularly um, rope or rigorous kind of um, calculator. It's just intended as a guide. So hopefully it may be helpful. So starting multi species on the farm, um, we will get into the WA centric part in a little bit, but these are just um, some tips that I've learned uh, over the last couple of years. So you are learning from the best. I've um, I've hopped onto the Lower Blackwood website uh, and looked at some of the webinars and some of the support that you've had, um, which has been stellar, really good. Um, so you are learning from you know, Christine Jones and um, David Hardwick and some really good um, advisors there. So that is fantastic. Um, once you've got the messages from those really fantastic advisors is to localise that advice, to look around um, in your particular environment and um, ground truth that advice and, and those learnings or guidelines um, with your local community, uh, local farmers, your own knowledge on farm as to species and prep and all those sorts of things. So there's certainly a lot to be learned, but just localising it from, um, from a, a regional point of view can be effective. Uh, when you are starting out, if you'd, if you'd like to benchmark how your multi-species is changing the farm or whether you are have, having beneficial impacts on the farm, a split paddock trial is the most is the easiest way to do that. So um, pick an average pair of paddocks. Um, they have to be uniform and, and just either split a paddock in half or use two paddocks side by side. And then you can quite easily um, test the regen versus the conventional or the multi-species versus the conventional or whatever you're trialling in that. If you want to start out on farm, um, address the major constraints first. So if there is an acidity problem or you have really high magnesium or there's a heap of compaction or a very troublesome weed, um, my advice is to address it first because the multi-species, again, is not a silver bullet. It, it can only do so much. So please address those major constraints before you start. Again, make sure your establishment is effective and compare back to that control if you're wanting to benchmark the multi-species. So that can be the, the cost between the two, the level of ground cover that you have. You could do a visual soil assessment, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. And when you're grazing, um, keeping an eye on the grazing days. So the amount of head in the paddock and how long they're in the paddock for or the split paddock for. So just a way to benchmark uh, some of, of those um, changes. So assessment tools, um, the shovel, I, I love my shovel. Um, not only does it provide me an opportunity to do some visual soil assessments, but it's also a very handy object of known size um, for bunging in the paddock and um, taking photo like you see here. So uh, dual purpose um, and very useful. So shovel is the primary um, tool that I have in my itinerary. Uh, I also really like the visual soil assessment book. So if you haven't seen this before, it's just a really good way to assess your soil visually, um, surprisingly, by the title, uh, by Graham Shepherd from New Zealand. So it's got a heap of information in there about um, how to benchmark your soil, and that's through various parameters like colour and texture and number of earthworms and such things. Uh, and it also gives you an idea of how to assess your pasture as well. So a book well worth reading and well worth having in the back of the ute. Uh, it probably only takes about 15 minutes to assess the soil. Um, so it's well worth doing uh, if you're trialling multi-species for the first time and you want to benchmark it against a, a business as usual paddock. Um, the phone as well, um, mostly everybody has a phone these days and we mostly carry them um, everywhere. So just some pictures. So if you've done that split paddock trial and you have an object of known size like a shovel or you can sight down a fence line and have multi-species on one side and conventional on the other, just taking some photos is just really beneficial. So they're date stamped and you can really see very quickly um, what impact you're having from a visual sense, both above and below ground. So taking photos, I take lots and lots of photos and they're very versatile and very beneficial. And again, that grazing days, um, dry matter cuts are great and I do them all the time, but they're time consuming. So if you are grazing livestock and you have a split paddock trial, just keeping an, an eye on the amount of days that they're in that particular paddock and the amount of head can help you back calculate if you want to or that can just be the measurement parameter that you use but very useful. 
I won't go into this too much because I know um, you've had excellent advice so far on this, um, but I really do like rotational or cell grazing management. So short duration, two to three days, tops, high intensity, leaving some residue behind. Uh, the multi-species can be quite rich, especially if we've got a reasonable ratio of um, uh, legumes and broadleaves and brassicas in there. So uh, if you have a pasture paddock that you can have them run off into, or if you want to provide hay and straw, you can do so, but certainly something just to give them um, a bit of room and scratch and give them a little bit of roughage there can be very beneficial, especially if they're young stock, um, they can be a little bit subject to bloat and such things. So um, please, if you think it's high octane fuel, give them a little bit of roughage, uh, extra roughage if you need to. Uh, certain times of the year, um, recovery times are obviously crucial. We need to maintain some residue, so maintain some solar panels, but also allow solar panels to regrow. So anywhere from 30 to 120 days rest um, may be applicable at certain times of the year and you have to be the judge of that on your particular farm. But we certainly want um, residue and we certainly want um, a good bounce back before we graze again. So that rest period is really important. If we get this right, we have really even grazing and especially with the multi-species because there's that tendency to cherry pick certain species at certain times of the year. If we get that even grazing management right, um, we see the persistence of the multi-species as a diverse mix is much improved and our regrowth is much improved as well because the pasture, um, the pasture grazing is quite uniform. We also keep our animals on a really consistent plane of nutrition rather than them going from you know, the lollies to the, to the roughage as such. If we can keep them um, grazing a more uniform feed without being allowed to cherry pick, it keeps them on a consistent plane of nutrition, which is really important. And we can make our feed last much longer so we have cheap feed at the end of it as well. So for um, general grazing systems, um, especially in Victoria, where obviously I do the vast majority of my work, I think the multi-species gives us a lot of options. So uh, we can certainly stabilise that fodder production. So rather than the peaks and troughs um, that we have in a, a winter dominant rainfall uh, area, we can use our summer active and our, and our early autumn active mixes to really stabilise that fodder production and push it out into times of year when we otherwise would not. So we start to reduce that reliance on winter feed a little bit over here uh, in terms of being able to provide a more even plane of production across the year. Uh, we obviously, in saying that, in, in providing the feed wedges, we reduce a lot of damage either overgrazing over the summer because we have um, multi-species to graze, which are actively growing, and in the winter, that extra biomass provides cushioning so that we don't do as much plugging damage um, when the paddocks are waterlogged. So there's quite a lot of um, soil health benefits uh, just above ground from promoting these feed wedges. We also provide a very diet for livestock with all those flow on benefits to fertility and animal health. And we have, I have seen changes in soil health and in the sustainability of farming systems as well. So these are actual changes that um, we have measured across the last four years. We're starting to see the ones down the bottom are slowly changing, but they are starting to change. So that reduction in inputs, particularly in hay and silage and fertiliser is starting to happen on, on some of the farms which are a bit more advanced, which might've had multi-species for two or three years. Uh, and there's an opportunity from a, especially in the Southwest to change calving and lambing patterns as well um, and to take advantage particularly calving patterns to take advantage of spring calving rather than um, the traditional autumn calving and to change our stocking rate and our grazing management to match. So that can be enormously beneficial um, for a, a winter dominant um, waterlogged kind of environment that we have over here to, change, to be able to change that calving pattern. Um, there's potential profit improvement because of these feed wedges and because of the fact that we don't have to boost winter production so much. And there's certainly green business opportunities. So I've just included a couple of photos that have popped up in um, the media recently. Uh, Coles is putting um, zero carbon meat on the shelves and obviously there's um, carbon neutral organic milk floating around as well. So I think there's great potential to position the business um, into niche markets if, uh, and multi-species can be one of the tools that we use to do that.
So um, this is the WA centric part of the post and my apologies, I've only done some really, really fleeting visits to WA um, yet. It is on the bucket list. Um, but I know from uh, looking at some rainfall data that obviously um, you have a lot of rainfall in, in the winter period, but really shelving off very abruptly in that December, Jan, Feb period, which is when, um, for example, Southwest Victoria, Cobden, I've listed it here down the bottom, uh, has a much higher rainfall over that summer period. So we have um, an advantage there in that we can grow those summer active multi-species much, uh, much more easily. But I do work in some Northern Victorian uh, environments or have worked in them in the past um, with various land care groups where the rainfall from in December, Jan and Feb is much, much lower. Um, so getting back towards uh, that type of um, total for you, for example, Bort um, and Landsborough. So there are some environments in uh, in Victoria that have summer rainfall that are similar, but they also don't have as high a winter rainfall as well. So they are a much lower rainfall um, across the year as well as through summer. So they do successfully grow um, multi-species, but they just focus a little bit more on getting them in as early as possible, which we'll talk about in a moment. So. I'm going to skew the um, the talk now to a more WA centric um, uh, perspective from um, some of these dry out ra uh, Victorian rainfall environments. So some of the questions that came through um, vetch peas and linseed don't come back strongly after grazing. Can we build soil and meet grazing requirements over the season or is there a trade-off? And the second one is, with our poor sandy soils and hot dry summers, it's challenging to get and keep a stand of plants growing year round. So hopefully this next slide will answer uh, those two questions. So I think um, in Northern Victoria, in some of those environments that I've, that I've advised projects on before, they start off really emphasizing the autumn spring um, multi-species. So uh, in terms of the mix, there's always ryegrass and clover in the mix. So we include those species so that we have um, a understory biomass that keeps going once our cereals, um, our vetch, perhaps our tillage radish uh, are grazed off. So those cereals um, and particularly vetch will only do one or two grazings. Our radish, our brassicas may hang on um, for another grazing or two, but eventually a lot of that mix will will drop out after grazing, but we really do need that annual rye and clover as an understory and a component of the mix to be able to keep that mix growing as long as possible. So certainly the cereals and the vetch and um, brassicas are very, very useful for early bulk feed. And some of the brassicas will keep going to a certain extent, but we need that ryegrass and clover as a component of the mix to be able to continue grazing that mix for, for as long as we possibly can. Um, the other thing that we do in in Northern Victoria in those lower rainfall zones is that um, we're a little bit strategic how we divvy up um, the farm. There's not, I don't have a percentage for you, but the, the premise is to sow part of the area with medium and long season annual mixes. And we are still talking annuals here. We haven't quite graduated to perennials uh, or mostly, but in those lower rainfall areas, we can um, keep the feed on part of the farm going for as long as we possibly can with long season annuals. And then we can sow down a certain percentage of the farm with short season annuals, so early and mid maturity varieties, and then graze off those short season annuals really, really quickly in the spring, um, terminate them in some way once we've got the bulk of their fodder off them, and then sow ASAP in spring into moisture with something, uh, quite a low diversity mix, probably just millet, sunnies, buckwheat, uh, and some brassicas, so quite low cost, uh, just in case we don't get a lot of rain over the summer. And we sow them as soon as we can in spring. So it might still be a little bit chilly for the millet, depending on soil temp, but we have to get them into moisture in Northern Victoria. And obviously that's the same in WA. So really optimising that um, September, October moisture that you have to get those multi-species up and going. So as soon as you get, can get onto paddocks, sowing ASAP in spring, so using that moisture to its optimum. And it's all about retaining that cover over summer, so building that organic carbon so that we can hold more moisture 
and utilise um, the moisture as effectively as possible will be key on those live soils and those lower rainfall um, summers and activating that soil biology so we cycle and store those nutrients and moisture as effectively as possible. So retaining that cover with some long season annuals and then um, utilising a certain segment of the farm, probably not going to be a massive part of the farm, with those shorter season annuals that we can probably get some spring multi-species going rather than summer multi-species. And I think it's going to be a slow burn. So it's it's about stretching the season over time um, and just being able to gradually potentially build organic carbon. So starting with the best or heaviest soils on the farm first, because they will obviously hold the most organic carbon and the most water, and using those um, to sow our spring multi-species annual mixes in, just to, gave, to give us um, some fodder as much as we possibly can in terms of fodder over the summer while keeping our cover because our cover will help protect our organic carbon and our moisture holding ability. So it is really about trying to um, really, really utilise that spring moisture to be able to optimise our feed and our cover. Um, potentially reducing, I, I'm not sure um, how much hay and silage is produced on farm versus bought in in WA, but certainly we produce in, in Victoria, produce a lot on farm, but potentially um, if the price is uh, reasonable, potentially reducing some of that silage and hay production on farm could help too by maintaining that cover. Uh, on some lower organic carbon soils and low CEC soils, compost could be an option. Um, uh, potentially for, especially for dairy farms, um, utilising that as a waste management stream and then um, being able to improve your organic carbon and your CEC and uh, water holding capacity could be very beneficial. Uh, in Gippsland, on some lighter soils, if they're taking over some undisturbed country, um, some of the farmers deep rip and then they will put down a deep tap-rooted plants to hold those ripping lines open so that they can optimise the use of subsoil moisture. Um, this is if that uh, the, the, some of the um, lighter soils over there happen to be quite compacted when they're taken over. So they deep rip them first um, and they do have quite good results getting the, forcing those roots down, um, those rip lines and into subsoil moisture. Um, I've put clay delving here with question mark. I don't know a lot about clay delving. I'm, I'm not qualified in that area, but I do know that it can help um, improve um, the water holding capacity of sand. So it may potentially be an option as well. So um, the annual multi-species are a tool and the long-term goal is to establish a perennial multi-species. So a diverse self-sustaining pasture that we just happen to top up occasionally when we need to if it gets a little bit patchy, um, but it does need to be earned. So the system needs to be ready and we need to be monitoring it with our eyes and our shovel as well. So some of the things that we can do to make sure that the um, we've, we've earned the right to transition from annuals to perennials is um, looking below ground. So visual soil assessments, soil tests, um, the friability of the soil, and then above ground, whether we can reduce some input. So whether those paddocks don't need as much fertilizer as they did, or whether they don't need any weed control, those can be signs that um, perennials might be able to persist and obviously our production as well. Um, if we start to see volunteers, particularly um, of species, desirable species that we may not have sown, that's a very good sign that our system is transitioning to a more perennial system, or if our plants just look like they're booming and they're really, really healthy uh, and productive, we can start to think that perennials might persist in those types of environment. Uh, this was another question that came through. So proper perennial prep, they really do have to go into clean paddocks. So the triple C um, we can use in the toolbox. Uh, the first one is competition. So our annual, particularly multi-species will start to um, smother out some of our weeds and they'll start to change, not only smother above ground biomass, but they start to change soil health parameters. So we can start to see nuisance weeds um, decrease. So competition is a, plays a really big role. And then chemical and cultivation as needed can really help um, prepare the paddock um, to a clean state so that we can get our perennials up and going. They do need a lot of TLC, especially in the first year. And obviously it's it's a slow burn. So we're only doing a, a small percentage of the farm uh, as it comes online to a perennial um, soil health um, level. 
and we are just going to do this slowly across the farm. It's not going to be a large proportion of the farm per year. So some of the species that we use, and, and there will be WA-based species, I'm sure, um, that I'm not familiar with, but some of the species that we use to good effect uh, in Victoria, uh, our perennial ryegrass, of course, is, is king, uh, especially in dairy systems. We utilise um, red and white clovers, subclovers, chicory and plantain as herbs are very beneficial in our systems. Uh, and coxfoot, phalaris and lucerne do play their part as well. Not used as much in dairy systems, but certainly um, do have their place. Uh, as I've said before, these are some questions also that came through uh, yesterday. I think the transition phase does have to be quite slow. So to minimise losses and, and loss in production, we really need to um, prepare the farm so that we can put perennials in so they they bounce straight out of the ground and they're produ as productive as they possibly can be because they are quite they are slow to establish, but they will um, persist of course and they don't there's no lag phase because we don't have to sow them year on year. So they can be quite productive. Um, a lot of Victorian dairy farms are perennial based, so they're very productive, but um, but they do need the right environment to go into. Uh, from WA perspective, we do need to pick the most drought tolerant and deep rooted species available. So some of these are deep rooted, the ones that I've listed are deep rooted and drought tolerant, but there's probably WA um, species that I'm not as familiar with that would fit into that list as well. Um, the second question was, do you think the establishment of perennial species can work for dairy farms? Um, Vic has predominantly perennial grass based farms at uh, dairy farms. So uh, I do think especially from a multi-species perspective, that we can have productive perennials on farm. It just has to be appropriate for uh, the particular farm. But in terms of um, a, a low margin enterprise, um, Victorian dairy, dairy farms are very highly geared. They're quite intensive uh, and it does work for them across Victoria. So I'll quickly run through some of the species. Chicory and plantain. Uh, chicory has few uh, ticks a few of the boxes a little bit more than plantain it's more competitive than plantain um, it has this lovely blue flower that's it on the right hand side of the screen it has this lovely blue flower that attracts pollinators as well so it ticks a few more boxes than chicory but both can be sown in spring and in autumn once we get to that perennial phase they both like about 500 millimeters of annual rainfall so well within um, wa's rainfall zones they're quite persistent once they get those, they're both taprooted. So once they get those taproots down and going and they're natural anti-wormers as well. So we can use them as part of a mix um, to start to reduce some of those inputs. And they're very, very high quality. So very good fattening feed, very good milk producing feed um, from these herbs. So I very much like to include chicken and plantain in mixes. They are expensive, but um, we can use as little as a quarter of a kilo to a kilo in a mix and have quite a good stand of chicory or plantain as a percentage of the mix. So uh, expensive per kilo, but not too bad once it's averaged out to a hectare basis. Uh, coxfoot, I quite like coxfoot. It's early days for coxfoot, especially uh, in the areas I usually uh, am involved in because um, it's not uh, traditionally a, a dairy um, species, but I think it's got a lot of merit as our perennial ryegrass zone starts to shrink in Victoria. So I would, um, at, we've, we've had some early results from some trials sown in the southwest and they're quite promising. So Coxfoot likes light soils and banks. Um, it has a quite a low sowing rate per hectare. So once we get to that perennial phase, it's quite cost effective to put in. And it handles grazing well. It's quite drought tolerant, responds rapidly to rainfall. And the newer varieties are quite good quality as well. So. There's summer and winter active varieties available. And I think it'll be quite interesting to have a little bit of a mix of both as one of the grass species in a paddock to capture um, winter and summer rainfall as well. Uh, Phalaris we use here to good effect, uh, particularly on beef farms, but some dairy farms as well on those really heavy soils. So potentially not, um, not as applicable to WA, but certainly over here uh, on some Problem paddocks, it does save our bacon when we start to get really waterlogged in the winter. So it mats on the ground once it once it's well established. Um, it has a really good um, biomass and, and root mass, and it can really hold, especially cattle up, 
um, out of the out of the wet, out of the mud. So can be very effective um, in its particular niche place. Can be a little bit clumpy, especially the older varieties, but the newer varieties um, are much more palatable. So um, certainly a niche species, but very good in its place. Uh, lucerne, um, I'm, I'm not sure um, how how much lucerne is grown in WA, but certainly uh, in Victoria, it has its place as well as that a perennial uh, or another perennial legume in the rotation. Very deep rooted and persistent once it's going. Um, there's different activities, so we can have almost uh, active almost all year round to very um, uh, winter dormant. So it just depends on the activity but it does need that summer rainfall for consistent grazing. So um, I, will I would use it as part of a mix rather than um, relying on it as a fodder option, but nevertheless, as a, a nitrogen fixing species, it could, uh, if you can get the seed at a reasonable cost, it could be potentially part of a mix. So in terms of adding in perennials or optimizing diversity, um, we, we'll talk mostly about perennials, but um, some of the diversity can be from letting annuals reseed. So I, I've seen this to good effect uh, over the last couple of years in that um, some paddocks can be strategically left to reseed. So our vetch, tillage radish, or all the brassicas really, tillage radish, fodder rape, leafy turnip, um, they will reseed quite effectively. Our vetch will and our chicory and ryegrass does too. So we certainly can let a lot of the plants reseed, whether they're annuals or perennials, um, we can see a lot of volunteer um, helping keep those mixes in the future quite low cost from that volunteering ability. If we're putting in perennials and we've got to the stage where we have got perennials in the system, if those perennials paddocks start to look a little bit tired and a little bit patchy, we can over sow into those gaps with more perennials or with annuals, but this is about adding perennials into the system. So we can take that opportunity if there's patchy paddocks to pop more perennials in, try saying that fast. Um, chicory and clovers, I quite like chicory and clovers because they do um, stand up to being sown in an annual mix. So this picture on the right-hand side is an annual uh, multi-species mix with quite a lot of chicory in it too. So um, it was over sown, uh, well, sown in the first year in an, in an annual multi-species mix. And this is actually its second year and it was over sown again with millet and a few other bits and pieces and competing quite readily with it, no problem at all. So some of our perennials can be aggressive enough in an annual mix to get going. Um, but bearing in mind that that's Vic knowledge or Vic observations, so um, tried and see on small areas, I would say, in WA. Um, we can over sow perennial base with annuals once we do get to a perennial base just to keep optimising that diversity. So that's this picture down in the left. That's the rotor strip tool going into perennial pasture and adding that diversity. That could be the other way around. So if you're annual based and you want to try some perennials and think your paddock is up to it, if you didn't want to lose that annual um, pasture base, particularly if you wanted to sow in the spring, um, you could optimise your annual production by retaining some of that annual and, um, and adding perennials in or you could do it um, the other way around, as in this instance, once you get to, to a perennial pasture base, you could add annuals back in to boost that dry matter production as well. Uh, you can abolish annuals entirely once you're ready, so either chemical or um, cultivation termination, or you can, um, you can sometimes pop perennials up through the seed bank by management. So um, if grazing management and fertiliser management practices are changed, Sometimes we see in the seed bank there are desirable species, particularly perennials, that just volunteer and start to appear in paddocks where they haven't been seen for quite some time. So sometimes that can happen is that those desirable species are in the seed bank and through changes in management, we actually see them manifest in the paddocks. So there's a quite a large um, array of options there to add perennials or diversity into the mix. It just depends where the farm is at that particular time. So um, this is a where to next slide because this is uh, somewhat applicable to WA. So this is a dairy farmer uh, in the southwest. He is in a high rainfall zone, so his summer rainfall is much more effective. But he had a really quite awful um, soil, really low carbon, CEC of about four. 
um, so very low um, nutrient holding and cycling capacity. And uh, he started making his own compost with advice from a compost company and he's made his own compost for about 10 years and that's really helped with waste management as well but it's also boosted his carbon levels and his um, his nutrient holding and cycling ability. Uh, he He's put multi-species onto the farm in the last five years and he's having a whale of a time to be honest. Um, this is November, this is a, a, a perennial multi-species mix, obviously a lot of chicory in there. Um, he's grazing his dairy herd off this he's got 300 cows on 300 acres he does have some out paddocks to cut hay and silage but the milking platform is a cow to the acre um, he uses no artificial fertilizer he dropped out urea um, 18 months ago and um, he is feeding a reasonable amount of grain per cow so that obviously is helping but he's had to pull the canola meal out of the ration as well so the quality in the paddock uh, is considerable even at um, at this stage of growth this is about seven and a half tons to the hectare um, cut in November that's my hat for scale there so um, from a very low carbon um, base a really light sandy soil he's built up the um, the productivity of it with quite a lot of compost but his own compost produced on farm and then he's added the multi-species in once the once the soils really improved to the extent that that they will be productive so this picture, we're nearly finished. This picture on um, the right hand side is um, part of us con conducting a VSA. So as part of the visual soil assessment, we, we pull a segment of soil out from under a fence line, which is usually undisturbed, untrafficked, so not compacted. It's usually not overly fertilized. So it's usually darker and more friable and has more biological life in it and just looks a better soil. Uh, but this hopefully you can all see my pointer. This is the um, bit of soil that we pulled out from under the fence line. And this is his paddock soil. So his, and this is the first time I've seen it, but his paddock soil is better than his under the fence line soil and considerably better. So there's real hope, um, I think, for light sandy soils, bearing in mind that the rainfall is quite different over the summer. But this is an example of a really light sandy soil using compost and multi-species to very good effect. So there is um, there is some some hope for light sandy soils. So some of the take homes that effective establishment is really crucial wherever you are. Um, it, it is just the make or break of the multi-species. So it really ne does need to be effective to be able to get them up and away and doing their job. Uh, if you do, they're consistently productive and that will vary. That's, you know, a sliding scale depending on the environment that they're put into. But across Victoria in low, medium and high rainfall zones, the multi-species are consistently productive if the establishment is effective. Uh, annual and perennial multi-species, we're crunching numbers behind the scenes on some of these trials and they do stack up to the conventional system financially. Um, sometimes it's because they um, outperform the uh, the conventional management practice in terms of biomass. Sometimes it's because we can drop inputs, but there's usually some measure where they end up stacking up financially uh, in comparison to the conventional. In terms of building carbon, it's a slow burn, especially on um, some of the medium to heavy soils that I'm covering because the, the carbon levels are quite high um, originally, so it's hard to see that change. But I think if we can show that we've increased ground cover for as, well as a percentage but also for more of the season if we improve our biomass production and again that's tons per hectare but it's also across the season as well and we can show that we're improving root depth which we can do with our visual soil assessment I think we must be having a beneficial impact on organic carbon so that production that improved production that we can monitor does have to be improving our organic carbon and our soil health as well so we do have the um, if we can show this from a regen perspective in comparison to our conventional system, then we know we are having positive outcomes in terms of organic carbon. Um, and that's crucial because that builds our production and our resilience, and it certainly helps us push our feed wedge uh, and our ground cover into um, drier, tougher times of the year. So if we can build our carbon and concentrate on doing that, we do start to build our production and our resilience across more of the year. 
So I think for grazing systems, we can have our cake and eat it too with our multi-species. So we can have short-term economic improvements, but also um, medium and long-term soil health and ecosystem functioning improvements. So from a holistic farming sense, I think multi-species in a grazing system are a fantastic way to improve um, the whole farm system. So that's it uh, in terms of presentation. These are just a few links that I think might be um, might be beneficial in terms of further information. So some of the land care groups I work with um, have quite a lot of information in terms of what they've been doing and the results that they've had. And then obviously Facebook is a really good resource for uh, region aid groups and um, peer support as such. So just a few little resources to leave you with. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Jade. That was brilliant. Um, so good to see your data. Um, and uh, we are we are doing a bit of local, a lot of localization actually through a few projects, but we haven't quite got to the point that you have with all of our um, recording yet. So um, we will have that available for our trials that we've done ourselves, our pasture biodiversity trials last year. Um, but very excited um, to hear um, so much commonality actually despite the little bit of, you know, obviously no summer rainfall, which you know summer rainfall does make a difference, but there's a lot of commonality nonetheless. Um, there are a few questions here that I'll um, address now. So Mark asks, were any of the direct seeded trials dry seeded into dormant or dead pastures? No, they weren't, Mark. We find that very difficult um, to do. So uh, even in our sort of medium rainfall zones in the spring, there's still enough activity uh, in the grass, even if it looks almost dead, to suck the moisture away from the seed. So if we're sowing in, even in early autumn and in spring, we still find those same results. The pasture doesn't have to be um, particularly competitive looking to be quite competitive for the seedlings. And if we do go too far into summer, we again run into that moisture risk problem. So um, we don't have a lot of dormant, uh, so, uh, dormant pastures in terms of uh, native pastures, so pasture cropping like coal size does in New South Wales. Uh, we don't have that type of environment that we can direct seed um, into those more dormant pastures. So we find it very difficult in Victoria to have truly dormant pastures. Uh, if we do have truly dormant pastures, that's um, sort of probably February when they are actually really quite dead. Uh, and then we're into severe moisture stress. So we do find it very difficult to um, have that timing where we can sow into uh, non-competitive pastures. Mm. We have a, I mean, here it's a bit of a, we kind of aim at, we say beginning of April is the break. So <laughs> if you get, you know, if you, you get it right, you can see just before then um, into, because our, our pastures are pretty much annuals, which are, dead <laughs> so there's nothing living other than the, than the weeds the flat weeds and in the in the pasture so it is possible here in the autumn not so much in the spring or definitely not in the spring spring is much harder for sure yeah. um andy says just to be clear you are recommending spraying out the area for initial seeding rather than direct drilling into existing crops have i got this right so that depends a little bit andy what you mean by existing crops so if it's an existing pasture base that is um, weedy, I would spray that out because there's potentially not a lot of beneficial species in that paddock. If it's a crop, uh, if it's, a, say, for example, you have a very opportune rainfall of NWA and you've sown a summer or spring active multi-species and you're going into the autumn, um, you could direct drill straight into that crop. Uh, if you're talking pasture base, though, I would either spray or cultivate out if you want that multi-species to get up and get established. So the direct drilling can work, but it can be very tricky to achieve, as I hope I've covered. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've probably covered the next question, but just in case there's anything to add, Larry says, please address our lower, lower spring summer rain and soil moisture reserve, especially in sand. I think you've pretty much covered that, haven't you? Really? Mm -hmm. that. Um, 
Uh, Larry also asks, are there green manure benefits from tillage establishment or corporation? I'm sure there are. Um, in a livestock system, though, uh, it's not often done. So I, I know only of a few farmers that have green manured um, and they're more hort farmers. I have um, been advising a few hort farmers over the last couple of years. Uh, they obviously green manure and they do see um, particularly a nitrogen benefit as well. Um, but not so much the, the livestock guys, they prefer to graze off rather than green manure. Um, I think it would depend very much on the soil type as well. So on the in the medium to high rainfall zones where we do often have a medium to heavy soil, it's probably less important for us to be um, green manuring, but certainly on a, a light sand, I think there is probably a huge benefit to green manuring. Um, the soil key machine that I spoke of before, it actually does, if there's a mulcher on the front, it does incorporate some of that green into the, um, into the topsoil as it's sowing. Uh, and that I think can be quite beneficial as well. So um, as a light green manure, if that makes sense. So there's probably ways that we can use some of the crop and then mulch and manure um, the residue to have a, a, a fertilizer benefit as such. Mm, yeah. Um, some of our dairy farmers here um, do irrigate in the summer. Um, and one of our dairy farmers in the, in the, in the very south, in the Scott River area, um, has had uh, trialling for the first time, really, some multi-species this summer, and he's had an amazing result on very light sand. <laughs> so um, we'll be interested to see how that goes in the, in, the, in the longer term. Would your advice generally be for people to start um, only autumn? With autumn and not a I, I think dry yes, I, I think dry land. Um, dry land certainly get the hang of the autumn multi-species first. Um, if the spring is going is if if say you can traffic the paddock in late August or September, the species mix that you put in there, I would advocate being very similar to the autumn mix. So if yeah. you're starting with an autumn mix, um, you'll get the hang of of an autumn and early spring mix by using an autumn mix first. And certainly um, if it's on a, a, a lighter sand with um, potentially some, some moisture issues over the summer, concentrating on those autumn mixes first can really help you get the hang of it first before you try some of the more risky mixes. Um, that would also, be the way I'd do it. And, unless there's irrigation, in which case spring and summer mixes, that, that's a complete game changer. Yeah, and I mean, you did your term earning the right, I think is very applicable, isn't it? I mean, there's no point in going to the spring if you've got very poor soils with no no biological life going or little, um, you know, your best bet is autumn to get that, yes. that moving again, isn't it? Um, That's right. Got another question from Mark. Uh, any strategies for over sowing into existing perennial strands stands without knocking them out? I think in terms of machinery, um, the soil key on those lighter soil types might be quite applicable. And the um, the rotor strip till, if it's I I'm looking to do more trials with the rotor strip till. It's a very new machine. It's it's only been used for the last two years uh, in our area. I'm actually looking to see whether they can do a very shallow cult level of cultivation. So really just scruffling the topsoil. So we end up with a a reasonably wide sowing row but not too much of an impact on on soil and soil structure so the soil key i think on lighter soils can be very beneficial uh, watch this space for the rotor strip tool as well but i think there's machinery um, like those two machines available which can help us over sow those perennial stands we actually had Niels Olsen come over last year was it last year the year before can't remember uh, anyway, for a little talk, and uh, there was a, uh, one farmer here who has actually purchased a soil key, so we've actually been able to use it here as a demonstration. Yes. And I think that uh, the general consensus here too is that for the lighter soils, um, yes, maybe, but not the, the heavier soils. And we do have some variety of soils. Yes, the majority is light, but we do have some clay soils here too. Um, yes. So there is that range. Well, I think... Um, because your presentation was so excellent and so detailed, there are that many questions. <laughs> you've, uh, you've covered them all. So um, I would like to uh, once again express our very um, great appreciation uh, for your brilliant talk.
Um, and it's so relevant because many of our group here are moving down the path to getting more diversity into their systems. Um, and yeah, there are challenges, but the rewards are there also. Um, so it's just great to get all this, more information. Um, I know it's getting late over there. I don't even have you had your dinner yet? Is it, it's two hours ahead, isn't I know. it? <laughs> <laughs> so you must be feeling a bit hungry. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I prepared by having a large lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think we'll let you go and uh, and have uh, have your dinner. <laughs> but um, for our audience's benefit, um, um, I just want to uh, say before they sign out. Uh, can I ask you to complete our webinar evaluation form? It's only going to take a couple of minutes and it's super helpful for us in making sure that we are providing the right content that's important to you. Um, so many thanks to all of you for attending and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next event, um, which is another webinar on May the 4th, this time with holistic grazing expert and pastoral ecologist Judy, Dr. Judy Earle, who was here earlier this year. Um, and she's going to be talking on planning your growing season grazing management, which is perfect timing for us as our grass has finally started to grow. Um, so I'll be providing some details on that webinar up on our web page shortly. And also, for those of you that don't know already, Margaret River in WA is playing host to the next Regenerative Agriculture Conference. Uh, Lower Blackwood is part of the steering committee, so I can tell you that it's going to be great. We've got some fantastic speakers lined up. So make sure you save the date, September 6th and 7th, and go to the conference website at uh, Regen 2023 to express your interest for early bird tickets. Um, I think that's important because I reckon they're going to go really quick once they are released for sale. So um, go on board and have a see. So thanks once again, Jade, and thanks once again to our, you, our audience, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night. My pleasure. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone.